In less than 24 hours, I'll be going into the ICU as Canada goes into its third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. I feel pretty safe going into the ICU though, since I've gotten my first COVID vaccine shot, I got Moderna, and then I also was fitted for an N95 mask. So overall, I feel like my safety measures are in place. I'm a second year medical student in Canada. So while I'm there, they're going to have me research different problems that we see in the ICU and try and find solutions by using the existing evidence. I just shaved everything except my mustache. What do you think? So tomorrow I have to wear an N95 and N95s are actually impacted or their effectiveness is impacted by having facial hair. And I think mustaches are okay. It seems like that's the case, but beards will actually impact the seal. I don't plan on taking risks of getting COVID, so that's why the beard is gone. Let me know in the comments if you think I should keep the mustache or just shave everything all together. I'm gonna be doing a bit of preparatory work before tomorrow, and I'll see you all then. I completely forgot to mention this yesterday, but I'm actually going to an operating room training session today before I head off to the ICU in the afternoon. I unfortunately can't take you in into the OR session with me, so I'm just going to leave you here in my locker. Just got back from the OR scrub session and it was great to get to scrub into the OR for the first time. It's not something I've ever done before, so I learned a lot doing that. I learned about the ways that sterility is maintained, how we keep aseptic technique in the OR, and uh, hopefully that keeps me out of getting yelled at by uh, surgeons or scrub nurses for doing the wrong thing. Overall, there's a lot of detail to it, so um, I probably won't remember all of it, but at least I got something out of that session. I'm back home now, and I'm just reading a Lancet paper before I have to go in on intensive care management of COVID. I'm not sure I'm going to get much recent info out of this. It seems like a lot of new evidence is coming up over time. I'm not really sure how much the management of COVID has changed, but uh, I don't think I'm expected to know too much since we haven't really covered much COVID-19 management in class. So a lot of this is just me taking this on on my own, and I imagine a lot of learning is going to happen when I'm there. So I just got to the Peter Lougheed Hospital, which is where I'm doing my ICU shift. And the interesting thing about this hospital for me is that I actually used to volunteer at this hospital. And now for the first time that I'm back at this hospital, I'm here as a medical student going into the ICU. And that is it. That marks the end of my first ICU shift. It was pretty interesting being back in the hospital that I once volunteered in. Definitely brought back some memories while I was walking in. And it certainly helped finding my way to the ICU. I'll let you know more about my experience today once I get back home. Right now, I just want to think about it a bit more before I share that with you all. Honestly, this has been such a long and emotionally draining day. Seeing what's going on in the ICU, it's a lot. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic when I was watching TV and that's the main way that I really viewed the pandemic. That's the main way that I was able to see what was going on. And the way that COVID was depicted in the ICU was that simply ICUs were being overwhelmed healthcare workers were being overworked. And the experience of health workers back when COVID had its first big wave was genuinely traumatizing for healthcare workers. 
but I think that healthcare has come quite far since then, since we've gained so much more of an understanding of how to deal with COVID, um, in terms of how much supplies do we need, how many people do we need working, how can we scale up our ICUs, and how can we provide healthcare workers with the proper PPE. And that was a major reflection that I had today, is that we are so much more prepared than we were a year ago, and some of the memories and some of the impressions that I have from the start of the pandemic have stuck with me since then, and um, until today they haven't been replaced. When I went to the ICU, there was a ton of patients that were battling for their life, battling COVID, and a good number also that were battling the effects of COVID whether that be secondary infections that are happening on top of a COVID infection or simply the adverse impact of clotting and inflammation that COVID causes on so many organs like the heart and the kidneys. I think the most dramatic thing that happened throughout the day was seeing a patient get intubated with COVID and their COVID was progressing into respiratory distress where this person started to breathe more and more quickly to try and get air into their lungs. And a person can only do that for so long without tiring out and without ending up with too little oxygen for their organs to be able to be properly perfused. So inevitably, a patient in this type of situation with COVID is going to need to get intubated. And that's what happened here. If you don't know what intubation is, it's a procedure where they essentially put a tube down towards the lungs and that tube helps provide an oxygen supply and it can also be used as a way of um, getting the lungs to inflate and deflate to properly ventilate the lungs and get oxygen to the body without having to have the person do it themselves. And when I think about intubation in terms of COVID, I realize that a lot of patients who get intubated will end up being on a ventilator for weeks, months, or just to never recover. And their last memory of being alive might be just before they're getting intubated. And even the patients that make it after being intubated still have a journey ahead of them. They're still dealing with the long-term impacts of COVID as well as the impacts of being put on a ventilator for so long and the drastic effects that that can have on the lungs. But there was one thing that surprised me in the process of intubating the patient. And that is the level of teamwork that went into this. If you're interested in a healthcare profession, you're probably well aware of how much teamwork is involved. One person can rarely do it all. And in the case of intubation, you need a full team. It started with physicians explaining to the patient what the procedure was going to involve and the impact that it was going to have on them, and then gathering some contact information for family to keep them updated along the way. And then after the patient was sedated and put under anesthetic, multiple physicians, nurses, and respiratory therapists all came together to do a team huddle to discuss what the plan was. Who is doing what? What do we expect could go wrong? How would we know that something's going wrong? And what is our plan B if something does go wrong? All of these things have to be discussed whenever a healthcare team is looking to address a new complex problem. After that, the team set off and everybody started to perform their functions and keep the team updated. It took around 20 minutes of well-coordinated effort to get the procedure done. Everyone left the room after that, except for the patient who might be there for weeks months, or for the rest of their life. For me, this was just like all of the harrowing stories that I heard about COVID in the intensive care unit, except what was different was that this was unfolding right in front of my eyes. For those working in the ICU, I imagine that seeing so many intubations, you just become desensitized with what this really means for the patient. While I didn't leave the ICU shift feeling overwhelmed, I've been left with a memory that I'll continue to process for a long time.